Hongkong. One of the wealthiest cities in the world. But by the 1980s, this center of global commerce found itself under siege. From the air, the city had grown up around its tiny airport, but had long since outgrown it. Now, the constant onslaught of huge commercial jetliners was endangering the lives of residents. And the airport's tiny size was threatening to choke off the lifeblood of the city. Trade. Hong Kong desperately needed a new world-class airport. But where to put it? There was only one option. to build it 16 miles out at sea. But that would require the largest engineering project in history. It would mean building the longest bridges in the world and massive new underwater tunnels, 22 miles of new superhighway and high-speed rail. Builders estimated the project would take decades. But they were given only seven years. Could engineers and builders working on an absurdly tight deadline pull off a project this extreme? And would building such colossal structures only invite disaster in the future? July 6th, 1998. New York's JFK Airport. Cathay Pacific Flight 889 prepares for takeoff. It's bound for Hong Kong, but it's about to fly into a great unknown. The pilots have made this trip hundreds of times before, but never like this. Because even as the plane lifts off in New York, in Hong Kong, the airport suddenly goes dark. It's not a power failure. This is an historic event. The culmination of nearly a decade of furious planning and construction. Hong Kong has just shut down one of the world's major international airports. And with planes en route, is moving the entire operation, staff and equipment, to a new one in only seven hours. It's the final hurdle in a seven-year race to complete the largest, most ambitious civil engineering project of the 20th century. It all began in the 1980s. when Hong Kong faced a critical turning point. By then, it had become one of the world's great economies. But these towering skyscrapers masked a glaring weakness. Kai Tak Airport. Dangerous and outdated, the airport sat crammed in the heart of the city. Kai Tak made every flight into Hong Kong a white knuckle flirtation with disaster, forcing massive jumbo jets to steer past mountains and skim the tops of apartment buildings in order to reach the tarmac. Six accidents or near misses occurred at Kai Tak in the last two decades. 
In this accident in 1993, the plane overshot the runway, injuring 22 and killing two. And there was another enormous problem, cargo. The airport had only one runway. It had become a major bottleneck to global trade. Hong Kong could not continue with his existing airport in terms of passengers, and even more important, in terms of cargo. Hong Kong is the biggest international airport in terms of cargo in the world. With billions of dollars at stake, Hong Kong needed a new airport. But where? The city was jam-packed without a shred of available land. There was only one possibility. Build the airport at sea. The proposal was mind-boggling. It called for the creation of a new island in the South China Sea. On that island, a massive new air facility capable of handling the world's largest jets and the single largest passenger terminal on Earth. But this massive airport was itself only a small fraction of the overall project. To get passengers and freight to and from the airport quickly, the plan also called for 22 miles of new super highways and tunnels. a new high-speed rail system, as well as the world's longest double-decker suspension bridge. Hong Kong's planners knew that without a new airport, the city would soon no longer be competitive in the global marketplace. But age-old politics threatened to stop the project in its tracks. Hong Kong, a British possession, was about to be returned to China. More than a century earlier, during the Opium Wars, Britain had captured Hong Kong from China. But as part of the peace treaty, Britain had agreed to return the territory after 100 years. Now that due date was a mere seven years away. Many dreaded the impending handover, fearing that China would put an abrupt end to Hong Kong's capitalist economy. If the new airport was still unfinished when they took over, would the Chinese agree to complete it? There was only one way to ensure that the airport would be done finish it before the takeover. The airport was uh, the pawn in, in this huge game of chess, the political chess that was going on. Engineers projected that under normal conditions, the project could take between 10 and 20 years. Now they had less than seven. In September 1991, the race was on. The first challenge, create enough level ground for the airport. Engineers had their eyes on a pair of rocky little islands called Chek Lap Kok and Lam Chow, 16 miles from downtown. But neither one of the islands was big enough to house the airport by itself. And they both were far too mountainous for long, flat runways. The solution? First, the mountains had to go.
With towering heaps of blasted rock as far as the eye could see, an army of workers was brought in. Their mission? Move 200 million tons of rock. Commanding giant earth movers, they demolished the landscape. Carting away hundreds of millions of tons of rubble. But all that material would not go to waste. It would soon be recycled as fill to turn the two small islands into a single larger one. But before that could happen, the sea floor needed to be cleared. For this task, a fleet of the world's largest underwater dredgers arrived on the sea. Like giant vacuum cleaners, their underwater hoses scoured the ocean bottom removing a layer of soft mud 40 feet thick to expose the stable rock below. The cleared seabed provided a solid base for what was to come next. A layer of sand, followed by the pulverized remains of the island's mountains. With every truckload, the mile and a half gap between the two small islands grew steadily smaller. Everybody was under extraordinary time pressure. It was one of the world's biggest land-moving exercises in the history of the world. working day and night, inch by inch. Workers on land and sea slowly turned two islands into one. By the time they finished, the workers had moved 600 million tons of earth, enough to fill the Roman Colosseum 200 times over. As the airport island was taking shape, construction crews had begun the daunting task of connecting the island to the city. Plans called for new tunnels, bridges, and highways to be built across 22 miles of land and water. Almost immediately, engineers ran into a problem finding a way out of downtown across Victoria Harbor. Two automobile tunnels had already been built in the harbor decades earlier, but they were now overloaded with traffic, sometimes causing two-hour traffic jams at rush hour. A third, much larger tunnel was needed. It had to be wide enough to carry six new lanes of traffic and long enough to span the one-mile underwater crossing. Engineers devised a plan to assemble the tunnel underwater from mammoth concrete and steel sections. The sections were manufactured at a harborside quarry 10 miles from the final tunnel location. Each one weighed 35,000 tons when finished, as heavy as a fully loaded ocean liner. When a section was completed, builders capped both ends with watertight seals, and then flooded the quarry. The massive tunnel sections were then floated out into the harbor.
Once at the final location, the seals were broken, flooding the section and causing it to sink. Powerful hydraulic jacks pulled the sections together and created a watertight seal. Then, builders made the final connections from the inside. And the tunnel was complete. It lay more than 50 feet underwater and stretched for more than a mile, connecting the busy island of Hong Kong to the mainland. With one waterway conquered, an even greater challenge loomed. Along the proposed route from downtown Hong Kong to the airport, there was another major body of water to cross. A three-mile span from the mainland to North Lantau Island. Initially, planners hoped to build another underwater tunnel here to carry airport traffic. But the channel turned out to be too deep. And heavy shipping traffic at the surface would have made underwater construction far too dangerous. So engineers had to come up with another solution. It was as bold as it was breathtaking. They proposed not one, but two massive bridges, long enough to span the waterways and high enough to allow even the most gargantuan ships to pass underneath. The longer span, more than a mile and a half long, would be one of the longest suspension bridges in the world. But it was a risky proposal. The bridge would need to withstand one of the most destructive forces on Earth. Typhoons. packing devastating winds up to 200 miles per hour. As many as eight typhoons slam into Hong Kong each summer. Any bridge built here would have to first prove its strength. To understand how winds would affect the structure, engineers first created computer models. This model simulates the motion of the suspension bridge in a 40 mile an hour wind, amplified 1,000 times, allowing engineers to identify potential design flaws. Using the data collected, engineers next built a detailed scale model. They placed it in a high speed wind tunnel and subjected it to a simulated Category 10 typhoon. The results were disturbing. The bridge would become dangerously unstable in high winds. Designers couldn't make the bridge any shorter, so they made it heavier. Below the main roadbed, they added a lower deck for trains and two more lanes for traffic. This design stiffened the bridge. It solved a potential problem and added capacity. But for the builders, the design raised the stakes. Now they had to build the largest double-decker suspension bridge in history with no extra time to do it. First, the building site was leveled. The next step, build two mighty bridge towers to shoulder the enormous weight of the fully loaded structure. They went up like skyscrapers each more than 60 stories tall. From these dizzying perches, 
heavy steel suspension cables would need to be hung to support the massive road deck. But the giant cables needed to be three feet in diameter and each weighed 15,000 tons. Because of their massive weight, the cables could not simply be assembled on the ground and then hoisted into place. Instead, bridge builders used an ingenious but risky technique. They built the massive cables in the air. Two spinning wheels shuttle several small strands at a time back and forth across the towers, each pass adding girth to the massive cables. Once the cables were secured in place, workers could tackle the final and most dangerous part of the job, installing the huge bridge decks. Each prefabricated section weighed a thousand tons and had to be hoisted from a barge on the water, 200 feet straight up. Starting at the center and working out toward the towers, builders painstakingly raised each deck section into place. Finally, five years after the project began, the bridge was complete. It was quite staggering to, to me and to others, I think, that we had constructed this, this monument, the sort of bridge to the future. The completion of the bridge and the tunnel provided the two crucial water links on the route from the city to its new airport. But those two links needed to be connected to each other. The project called for two brand new highways. The first, the Kwai Chung Expressway, would take traffic from the tunnel, six miles down the coast, all the way to the new bridge. Building it through the congested Kowloon Port District was like trying to arc a bridge over a raging river. To keep the port open and traffic moving, builders were forced to construct the new highway over an existing 15 lanes of traffic. And that wasn't all. To minimize traffic slowdowns, the construction crews could only work at night. Road crews raced to bolt together Hong Kong's first ever highway in the sky. Meanwhile, the other highway, the final link in the chain, was also under construction. This eight-mile road called the North Lantau Expressway would take traffic from the bridge to the airport. But this last leg also presented a major engineering challenge. The terrain where the highway was to go was made up of rocky, steep hills. So engineers came up with a novel solution. They decided to extend the coastline out into the bay by more than a half mile. The highway, rail, and the airport's power lines would travel over this newly created level corridor. Builders dumped more than 25 million tons of rock into the ocean. Enough stone to build a five-foot-high wall from Washington, D.C. to San Francisco. As a consequence of the, uh, the high level of activity, 
we actually crammed into four to five years, 10 to 15 years of work effort. When this final link was finished, the route would be complete. A brand new thoroughfare winding its way from the airport along eight miles of coastal highway across one of the world's longest suspension bridges, over six miles of elevated highway through an underwater tunnel into downtown Hong Kong. And yet, it wouldn't be enough. The new route would be great for cars and trucks, but it would do nothing for the 2.4 million people who use the subway. So engineers decided to add an ultra high speed rail line. It was an historic first. Anywhere else in the world, you will find that, that the railway has been fitted in afterwards. So we had an opportunity to design a railway in conjunction with the design of the, of the airport itself. The new airport express would need a 15-acre station downtown. Hong Kong didn't have 15 feet. Planners were not to be denied. Engineers created 50 acres of new land in Victoria Harbor. In only two years, the new station rose out of the ground. A foyer to the distant airport. Here, passengers could gather check their bags onto their flights, and settle in for a 20-minute ride. Beneath the harbor, across the bridges, along the coast, and step off the train inside the world's largest passenger terminal. There was just one problem. there was still no passenger terminal. With only two years left on the ticking clock, construction finally began on the terminal complex. The plan called for the largest enclosed space in the world, more than a mile long. But as builders began work on the terminal's massive foundation, they made a chilling discovery. Ocean tides were forcing groundwater up into the foundation. If not corrected, that groundwater would push the terminal off its foundation. All six million square feet of it. Engineers knew they couldn't fight the force of the tides. They needed to find a way to secure the building against that steady pressure. Using massive hammer drivers, they pounded huge concrete piles into the earth, each weighing 25 tons. The piles went through the landfill down to the ocean floor, effectively nailing the terminal to the bedrock. With the foundation secured, work on the terminal itself could begin. It was to be the crown jewel of the entire project. A passenger terminal of epic proportion. Its unique design was symbolic of flight. But just as construction was about to begin, project managers came to another disturbing realization. There was simply no way they could build the terminal fast enough 
to make the looming deadline. Project managers were forced to enter a new series of negotiations with the Chinese, who were getting ready to assume control of Hong Kong in less than two years. While negotiations continued, engineers pressed ahead with the daunting task of raising the terminal roof. Luckily, the design itself was remarkably simple. It was made up of a repeating lattice of steel trusses that could be mass-produced on a gargantuan scale. Builders set up an enormous assembly line to build 136 identical roof segments, each weighing 140 tons and crafted out of more than 100,000 individual pieces. But the roof segments were so large, they couldn't be moved with existing equipment. So engineers came up with this. A behemoth robotic transport crane piloted by a single operator with a remote control. Once at the site, giant cranes stretching 20 stories high carefully lifted each piece into place. On the other side of the island, workers erected the airport's air cargo terminal, a state-of-the-art facility. It was designed to handle the flood of containers that would pour through the airport every day. July 1st, 1997. The day of the handover is here. For the first time ever, a democratic society with a free market economy is turned over to communist control without a shot fired or a voice raised in protest. But there's a hitch. The airport is not finished. And now China is in the driver's seat. Engineers are afraid that the Chinese will pull the plug and abandon the project so close to completion. They do not. Realizing that the airport is crucial for Hong Kong's survival, the Chinese agree to one additional year to complete the project. But construction teams know that's not enough time. That's because the airport will utilize a vast array of new technologies, including new systems for air traffic control, flight information, custom screening, and security. The one-year deadline leaves insufficient time for testing these new systems. But on July 6, 1998, time was up. Seven years of round-the-clock construction, a $20 billion price tag, and 10 million man-hours had come down to this one final challenge, perhaps the most ambitious of all. Shut down the old airport, divert all traffic, pack up staff and equipment, and relocate to the new airport in just seven hours. Meanwhile, thousands of miles away, 
Cathay Pacific Flight 889 crosses over Hawaii. If all goes according to plan, it'll be the first plane to touch down at the new airport at 6.30 a.m. But for now, it's a Hail Mary pass. Because the new airport is still not operational. At 1.17 a.m., the runway lights at the old Kai Tak Airport are switched off for the last time. Goodbye, Kai Tak, and thank you. The massive road, rail, air, and sea lift gets underway. It will take more than 800 trips to ferry the critical contents to the new Hong Kong International Airport. As the sun rises on July 7, 1998, the new air traffic control makes contact with its first customer. At 6.25 a.m., Flight 889 touches down on the north runway. Hong Kong International Airport is up and running. It was great excitement, right? Uh, this was the very first uh, aircraft that landed with passengers. Everybody is very happy, uh, very celebratory mood. But elation quickly turns to concern. One of the critical systems suddenly gives out wreaking havoc in the passenger terminal. It's the flight information system. Monitors go blank. Aircraft gate assignments tangle. And thousands of passengers are delayed. And that's not all. Across the tarmac at the air cargo terminal, things are even worse. The communication link with the old airport goes down. And then, someone accidentally deletes a critical database. The most technologically advanced airport in the world is now forced to sort all cargo by hand. But they can't keep up. Soon, the tarmac is packed. The airport is forced to turn away 55,000 tons of freight. It's a discouraging opening day. Within weeks, passenger numbers begin to climb. Things are almost running smoothly. More than 500 flights arrive or depart each day double the traffic handled by Kai Tech at its busiest. The cargo terminal also gets the kinks out. Just as planned, the vast maze of fully automated lifts and cranes moves, sorts, stacks, and transfers more than 4,000 tons of cargo a day. Everything from lobsters to helicopters. Life was returning to normal for the young airport. Until Mother Nature came calling. Only a year after the grand opening, Typhoon Sam slammed into Hong Kong. Winds gusted over 100 miles an hour right in the middle of the storm. China Air Flight 233, carrying 315 passengers, began its final approach. 
The plane had already tried once to land, only to abort and return to the skies. In a fateful decision, the pilots attempted another landing. In the final seconds, the plane's right wing suddenly dipped, colliding with the runway. The plane flipped completely over and skidded down the tarmac. Emergency crews rushed to the burning plane. Still, 200 people were injured. And three died. It was the first serious accident for the Hong Kong International Airport. It led to stricter flight rules and beefed up weather radar. The new infrared system will most likely help to prevent similar accidents in the future. But what about the terminal itself? Can such a huge open structure really stand up to the worst that Mother Nature can throw at it? The year is 2010. A Category 10 typhoon with wind speeds up to 200 miles per hour, bears down on Hong Kong. The storm's track has it making a direct hit on the airport. Emergency plans go into effect. Air traffic control diverts incoming planes to other airports, and outgoing flights are canceled. But now there's an even greater concern. The hollow glass terminal building now seems like a sitting duck. Engineers worry that the building could be ripped right off its foundations. The building trembles and groans. And then, the sound of shattering glass. It's a terrifying occurrence, but it actually relieves the pressure from the wind. Possibly saving the building. The largest enclosed structure in the world survives with minimal damage. While it's unlikely that anything this complex will ever be built again as a single project, the lessons learned are invaluable. And as other cities and countries look to their futures, we can have no more inspiring an example of extreme engineering than Hong Kong.